डॉक्टर पंकज चतुर्वेदी सर ही इज हेड एंड एक सर्जिकल ऑन्कोलॉजी डिप्यूटी डिरेक्टर सी सी ई टाटा मेमोरियल हॉस्पिटल मुंबई डॉक्टर अरविंद कृष्णा मूर्ति ही इज प्रोफेसर हेड एंड एक सर्जिकल ऑन्कोलॉजी कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट अडियार चेन्नई डॉक्टर अशोक दास ही इज प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हेड एंड एक ऑन्कोलॉजी डॉक्टर बी परवा कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट गुवाहाटी आसाम The talk is by Dr. Poonam Joshi. She is associate professor, head and neck surgical oncology, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. I would request Poonam, ma'am, to please uh, go ahead with the presentation. Thank you, Tita. So I uh, once again welcome uh, you all and. Uh, thank you dr arvind and dr ashok uh, and uh, i will be talking on the uh, topic that is the bite composite resection or the bi alveolar resection and uh, i would request both of you to interrupt uh, me as and when you feel it is appropriate so uh, so if we look into the history of oral cancer surgery it is actually very interesting uh, i would just uh, when i went through the literature i could see that uh, the history of oral cancer surgery started with the resection of tongue cancers so that history dates back to 17th century and uh, the initially the tumor resection was started with the use of ligatures and these ligatures were uh, tied around the tongue tumor and this uh, the blood supply was uh, hampered or was uh, and the tumor was strangulated and this tumor then sloughed out of uh, on its own after 8 to 10 days then this there was the use of, uh, use of this uh, this uh, chain like uh, thing which was an instrument and this tumor was uh, was strangulated with the help of this and uh, this was followed by the use of a Uh, i think this is the first uh, cautery which was used and this was called as the galvanic aperture so this had a uh, crushing wire like loop in the uh, front part and there was a placement uh, of battery inside this uh, area through which heat could be transmitted to this wire and with the help of the wire, uh, crushing effect and the heat the tumor of the tongue were excised this was followed by the era of composite resections mainly for the mandible uh, mandible cancers so uh, we have seen that the term commando and the composite resections are used most of the time uh, as uh, interchangeably initially the term commando or the composite resection was used for the uh, hemimandibulectomy radical neck dissection resection of the base of the tongue or palate or whenever the primary tumor wherever the primary tumor was located along with the tracheostomy so how come this term uh, this commando operation came into picture so during the second world war uh, there were a lot of uh, attacks going on in europe and that time the armed forces were given special training and they were called as commandos similarly uh, the head and neck surgery was evolving and it was quite radical at that time needing a radical neck dissection with major surgeries and they also needed special training of surgeons of that era so they this term was taken from there and these surgeries were called as commando surgeries dr grant ward was the first one who carried out in continuity removal of primary uh, along with the uh, resection of neck nodes however it was dr hayes martin who made this procedure uh, more popular and uh, named it formally the commando procedure so uh, what is a bite composite resection a bite composite resection is basically uh, the excision of the superior and the inferior alveoli with the intervening interalveolar tissue which is like a bite and this is done along with the soft tissue formed by the four muscles of mastication so uh, when i try to look into the literature uh, the data regarding the bite composite resection though there is lot of data uh, for the composite there was hardly any literature about the bite so uh, as we know that the lesions uh, which require bite composite resection they mainly involve the buccal mucosa gingival buccal sulcus and retromolar trigone area and uh, these are primarily 
Indian subcontinent disease and they are associated with the habit of long exposure of tobacco to these areas. This term has been mentioned uh, in literature by Dr. Chokar et al. So what are the indications of bite composite resections? So any tumor which involves the retromolar trigone area sulcus or upper envelus. The buccal mucosal lesions which involve the upper and lower gingival buccal sulcus. So as we all know that the uh, retro uh, retromolar trigone area is a triangular area which is formed uh, on the medial aspect by the temporal crest on the mandible, on the lateral aspect by the anterior border of the ramus and base is formed by the uh, posterior to the socket of the third molar. So uh, the root of RMT lesion spread as we know that retromolar trigone area is basically considered as an anatomic cro crossroad where the muscular and the nervous components converge. From here the tumor can spread to the buccinator muscle, subcutaneous tissue to the skin or it can come medially to the medial pterygoid muscle. Here it can go to the parapharyngeal fat, to the tonsil or it can go to the uh, heart palate. So uh, if we see that uh, the retromolar trigone area is basically formed uh, by the uh, a thin uh, mucosa over the mandible and just beneath that lies the pterygomandibular raphe. This pterygomandibular raphe is basically a fibrous condensation of buccopharyngeal fascia which extends from the level of hemulus of the medial pterygoid plate up to the uh, mylohyde ridge on the mandible. So this pterygomandibular raphe is an important conduit in the spread of hedonic malignancies. Uh, this, uh, the, the pterygomandibular raphe along with the muscles form the pterygomandibular space which contains the lingual and alveolar nerves and they get uh, involved in the early uh, course of the disease. So if you look into the spread of the gingivobuccal sulcus complex disease, uh, these gingivobuccal sulcus disease, they mainly spread to the, uh, to the buccal mucosa, from buccal mucosa they go to the buccinator muscle and then they ulcerate through the skin. In the upper GBS lesions, they basically erode into the, into the maxilla and then they go intrasinus. So as we see here once again, uh, so if we see this is a diagram which shows that this is the upper gingivobuccal sulcus. This is the lower gingival buccal sulcus, this is the buccal mucosa and this is the buccinator muscle which is considered as the anatomic barrier to the lateral spread of the tumor. So once this tumor uh, spreads to the uh, goes through the buccinator muscle, it can go into the buccal space from where it goes to the buccal pad of fat and then the retroenteral fat and then can spread to the infratemporal fossa or it can follow a lateral course where it can go to the masseter, subcutaneous tissue and to the skin as we saw in the previous slide also. So the, what are the roots of bone invasion? The tumor can uh, in a dentate mandible, the primary tumor that spreads uh, through the junction of the, uh, it spreads through the junction of the fixed mucosa and the uh, reflected mucosa as we can see here. Whereas in a edentulous mandible, the spread of the tumor is through the uh, socket of the uh, gum or the teeth. So uh, the spread of the maxillary alveolus uh, tumor is also into the maxillary alveolus is also similar to the mandible. So when we are planning to operate a oral cavity cancer, there are certain factors which we have to consider when planning a resection. So the foremost important among them is the intraoral assessment of the disease. Then the skin involvement or the beauty uh, orange appearance of the skin, the paramandibular disease and the deep soft tissue infiltration. So coming to first the intraoral assessment of the disease. Whenever we are assessing the disease, it is important to look for the epicenter of the disease. As we can see here, the epicenter is the buccal mucosa and then uh, the extension to the upper gingivobuccal sulcus, lower gingivobuccal sulcus, its proximity to the oral commissure, its extension into the retromolar trigone area and the palate. Regarding the assessment of the skin, uh, the careful inspection and digital palpation is the way to go. 
there is a uh, however there is a study which is published by dr chokar et al which has shown that ct scan is an effective radiological tool in predicting the depth of invasion preoperatively and the objective preoperative measurement of distance between the tumor and the skin can help the clinician in achieving the adequate soft tissue margins so how do you assess the skin involvement the skin involvement can come in various forms as we can see here it can look like a pudy orange appearance or it can be the appearance of a tethered skin as we can see here uh, with the loss of hair follicles it can be in the form of a uh, impending ulceration or it can present as involvement of the skin with frank ulceration so uh, then the another point which is important here to consider is the paramandibular disease so uh, i think the previous session also uh, there was some discussion regarding the paramandibular disease so uh, what is a paramandibular disease a paramandibular disease is basically a soft tissue disease which lies adjacent to the mandible in a vertical plane and uh, this basically acts as a surrogate for the uh, segmental mandibular tunnel so we can see here this is the uh, slide where we can see uh, this patient has a perimandibular disease basically in the soft tissue mandible is not eroded and if we see this uh, on the over the skin this area there is edema and soft tissue disease so for this patient a segmental mandibulectomy was performed so as to achieve good uh, bone and soft tissue margins uh, so uh, dr arvin uh, and dr ashok uh, hello hi punam uh -huh. hi uh, sir any uh, pankaj sir uh, good evening sir good sir evening. any uh, sir any uh, point on this sir because we have seen that paramandibular disease is basically more of a, a subjective term and most of the time uh, there is not any objective criteria to define it so sir how to go ahead, go ahead in these situations so thank you punam i think uh, uh, it was a wonderful discussion and i learned a lot uh, from your uh, presentation and uh, basically uh, what we have to understand that whenever we are removing the tumor we have to have a tumor free margin of at least 1 cm from all sides now when we say all sides that means all the mucosal margin and in this case what you are showing there has to be a bony margin and there has to be a soft tissue margin so the ultimate aim of any surgeon for such patients is that you have to have at least 1 cm or thumb breadth of the lower border of the mandible and when we have to achieve that there has to be a soft tissue cuff around the tumor on the paramandibular side as well if you are able to achieve that that is an appropriate dissection if you are not able to do that then in that situation either you plan for segmental or you plan for you know uh, posterior segment mandibulectomy sometimes in the absence of segmental that we might do but you are right that subjectivity is one thing but we know that paramandibular when we say the word means that the tumor may have already infiltrated from the cortical surface of the mandible and therefore when you do any kind of stripping or any kind of taking it away from the mandible your margin on the bone and the soft tissue would be positive intraoperative Sir, uh, Dr. Arvind, you would like to say something? I, I think uh, Ankaj has uh, elegantly summed it up, and uh, very important to get uh, soft tissue margins also around. Like, and and of course, you as you said, para mandibular. Traditionally, of course, the thing was that it is considered a contraindication to do a marginal mandible activity. Uh, but of course, uh, concepts make it slightly changing. but uh, in the interest of the current audience I, i feel that you know we have to keep stick to standard literature so let's not complicate things by putting more terminology i, I feel like you know in a traditional teaching they say that uh, extensive paramandibular spread may be a contraindication for a uh, 
marginal mandibulectomy and as dr pankaj said like earlier a lot of people used to do what is called as a periosteum stripping and all those things and there is a high chance that you you would sort of you know uh, i mean the, it was uh, it was mentioned by certain groups in in the uk that you do periosteal stripping but that practice uh, has not sort of you know caught up so it's uh, preferable that uh, you get good mucosal margins good soft tissue margins and good bony margins also and in this case traditionally you would possibly land up by doing a segmental mandibulectomy in such patients so i think yeah. we'll go ahead yeah. uh, yes yeah. doctor yes. one point Please. yeah one point i just want to make uh, yeah. the only fallacy in periosteal stripping is the uh, margin in final histopathology report because the pathologists they do not uh, basically they do not look into this matter and in their final histopathology report uh, eventually they give a closer margin that become a, a issue sometimes even with marginal mandibulectomy also after doing a good marginal mandibulectomy the pathologists they give a closer margin on the medial side this is a very gray area so uh, many a times the pathologists do not include the distance uh, of the uh, you know uh, the bone attached with the soft tissue specimen eventually in the final histopathology report the medial margin or the inferior margin that comes closer and that's become a matter of debate in the joint tumor board for uh, inclusion of uh, uh, addition of uh, adjuvant uh, radiotherapy so i think uh, to, to add some there's a question in the chat i think uh, one doctor had asked the, about the role of new adjuvant chemotherapy in mandibular preservation uh, this was something that you know i i just wanted to sort of you know uh, it it's i think there is good phase 2 data uh, from the tatas and of course uh, you are all a part of the study uh, and I, I i assume that a phase 3 study is ongoing uh, so we will sort of you know have to wait but i think uh, Uh, even in it's a it's not a newer concept maybe even in lisa lesitra's paper in uh, 2003 itself now you she had about 20% of the mandibles that were actually preserved by giving new adjuvant chemotherapy but the, then this concept has not yet become standard of care it is in a very exciting area and uh, we will await uh, phase 3 data before actually making it a standard of care sure so okay, i want to add yeah, something so i completely agree with you arvind that uh, Uh, such things should not be part of the postgraduate discussion uh, right. they are something that to be discussed at a level where we have uh, understood the biology of the disease the response to treatment and once we have evolved then we take it as an experimental treatment but certainly if you have given induction chemotherapy to a stage 4 disease and the disease has shrunken then at that point the confusion may arise and you have to take the patient in confidence whether you want to do a segmental marginal or uh, as per the original the data is completely fluid as uh, arvind rightly said one of the questions that uh, has come that if we are able to pinch the skin should we save the skin i would again say that uh, it is not pinching the skin if there is any uh tethering of the skin because sometimes it depends upon how hard you pinch the skin and you will be able to lift anything but any time if you put your hand on the skin and you can feel the back of the tumor don't try to pinch it but if you can feel the tumor from the skin the skin has to come out and the reason is very simple when we say buccinator is the barrier the difference between the the distance between the buccinator the buccal pad of fat and the skin is less than 1 cm in many people especially when people are having pan masala and submucous fibrosis so it is less than 5 mm sometimes and therefore i would say that a skin when we are planning to remove we should be liberal b when and we are planning the neck incision especially for the post graduate the neck incision should be planned only when you have marked the skin in excision and it should be in conjunction because small in skin incision can be taken en bloc and the closure can be done by the rotation of the neck flap itself it's a it's a small uh, defect correct sir so sir thank you so much yeah. sir uh, so we'll go ahead with the uh, next slide so we were discussing that what are the important factors which we have to consider while planning uh, for the intraoral resection so another important point is soft tissue infiltration which uh, we should be aware of 
So again, this is almost a similar slide where the uh, soft tissue infiltration can look uh, the involvement of the overlying skin or it can be like we were discussing these uh, diffuse edema over the skin where the margins are not very well defined. Even the soft tissue infiltration can present uh, in the form of trismus due to the, uh, this could be due to the infiltration of the infratemporal fossa. So these four points one uh, has to consider while planning uh, the resection of the tumor. So like uh, Pankaj sir just said that there are various kinds of incisions which we uh, usually use for uh, in planning the, their uh, approach to the tumor. So if we see this is the uh, one of the most commonly used uh, uh, the incision which is a midline incision. Uh, here usually this is preferred in cases where the tumor is away from the uh, oral commissure and it, since we are not cutting the uh, angle uh, of the mouth there is uh, we are saving the uh, we are saving the marginal mandibular nerve supply to the lip and the other muscles of the face in that case it is considered that the oral competence is better this is the other incision which is taken as the angle split incision uh, usually it is taken when uh, the tumor is close to the oral commissure then this is the third incision which we call as the chin sparing or the McGregor's incision. This is uh, again taken with the aim to have a better cosmesis. But when I tried to review the literature, I saw that this incision which is a modified McGregor's incision or also called as the chevron uh, uh, chin sparing incision. This is considered as the best. Uh, it has uh, these uh, stepped uh, incisions onto the lip and onto the chin and is then extended onto the chin uh, around the chin uh, and this is considered to give the best cosmesis uh, to the lip, good sensation to the lip and better oral competence. So uh, Dr. Ashok, in your practice, uh, do you often use this kind of incision or uh, this is more of a, uh, a literature review because at TMH also very, uh, we don't often use this kind of incision. Yes, I totally agree, Puna. We follow the same incision. But need yes. to be very careful uh, if the lesions uh, or if the excision comes closer to the angle of the mouth, then we have to split in the angle. That's the difference. Correct. So uh, I think the next kind of incision, which already uh, Pankaj sir said about is whenever the skin is involved, or is close and you feel that the skin is not pinchable. In that case, circumscribing the involved skin and then extending the incision accordingly is the way to go. So now coming to the white composite operative steps. So we already spoke that a careful uh, assessment of the intraoral uh, disease is important. So in uh, this case, uh, which we are going to discuss, we took an angle split incision for the obvious reasons we already discussed. A level one to five neck dissection was performed before that, before starting the primary because of the involved neck nodes. And then mucosal cuts were taken at a distance of one centimeter from the primary tumor after a careful inspection and the digital palpation of the disease. The incision was taken up to the depth of uh, subcutaneous tissue, uh, taking the buccinator muscle as the soft tissue margin. So uh, Dr. Arvind, what is your take on this thing that uh, what, when there is a, a surrounding uh, leukoplakia or there is surrounding melanoplakia, what margins do you prefer in those cases? I think that's a very uh, important uh, question. We'll have to actually categorize the lesion proper, uh, properly, you know, because there are various types of uh, leukoplakias, you know. Uh, so if it is a, a sort of a more ominous, this tends like if it's a sort of an erythroplakia or a leukoerythroplakia, which is ominous. And I, I think uh, you'll have to sort of, you know, all this you'll have, you'll get by a good intraoperative uh, clinical examination and also sometimes by palpation. And as you rightly said, no, it is, uh, you'll have to also palpate the lesion. You'll also have to see the induration. But in case there is, where there is an erythroplakia or a leukoerythroplakia, wherein you suspect that there is going to be a continuation of the tumor, then you'll have to give margins for that as well. 
but if it's a simple melanoplakia or a homogeneous leukoplakia in in that case of course there's a clinical call you will have to sort of you know give so the important aspect is that you will have to give margins for the uh, visual aspect of the tumor and also for the induration so that's more important i think so the soft tissue margins are uh, uh, getting a negative soft tissue margin is a very very critical aspect in these uh, cancers correct sir. so going ahead with the presentation so this is followed by oh, raising Una, yes, only, one, yes, uh, only one thing arvind very rightly said so when we include the uh, dysplasia or the erythroplakia or leukoplakia in the margin the depth of excision will vary when we are dealing with the leukoplakic lesion versus the one in the malignancy so what happens that arvind is right that if you have uh, dysplasia or leukoplakia in the margin we have done our own study and we have found that the survival is almost equivalent to margin positive when there is a leukoplakia now coming to excision as i said that you can tailor made your incision where the depth of excision can be lower on the other side but what is more important that whenever we are doing the excision please do not think of reconstruction at the time of excision see what happens many of the surgeons they do the reconstruction themselves so i want the youngsters to remember one thing that reconstruction should be planned only when the excision has happened but in your back of your mind when you are thinking that i have to do a primary closure i have to do a pmmc i have to do some kind of local flap then you start you know compromising on everything correct sir so uh, i think uh, uh, pankaj sir and Ar uh, arvind sir has already elaborated it well very well uh, i will be going to the next step so this is followed by the raising of the cheek flap uh, this cheek flap is raised in a plane between the this you can see a uh, subcutaneous fat layer and these are the muscle, uh, facial muscles along with the buccinator so leaving behind the buccinator muscle and the other facial muscles at the lateral soft tissue margin on the tumor so as we can see here further this raising of the cheek flap this is followed by defining the uh, anterior bone margin so uh, then uh, there is like the facial artery and the vein are ligated lateral to the buccinator muscle and the upper flap is also raised so while raising the upper flap uh, there is one word of caution that when the upper flap is raised uh, the especially the new uh, students or the residents have to be careful that the flap should not be raised over and above the uh, zygomatic bone and uh, the assistant should be careful not to be pulling the upper flap uh, with too much of force it is because that uh, because of the uh, traction injury to the zygomatico temporal branch of the facial nerve which lies uh, over the zygomatic uh, bone so this needs to be taken care of when uh, raising the upper flap so once you have raised the upper flap the uh, mesenteric and the parotid fascia which together is called as the parotidio mesenteric fascia is exposed this fascia is basically a condensation of the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia it is loosely adherent to the mesenteric while it is tightly adherent to the parotid once we divide this fascia the parotid duct is exposed so this parotid duct as we can see here we have tried to mark it it follows a transverse course on to the mesenteric it follows a uh, this course on to the mesenteric and then it traverses to the buccal pad of fat from where it uh, then it turns abruptly medially to penetrate the buccinator muscle and it opens against the upper second molar tooth so a careful ligation of parotid duct is a must as it can lead to salivary fistula leak in the post operative period and can lead to lot of complications along with that one point i would like to add here is that in one uh, fifth of the cases this parotid duct is accompanied by a accessory parotid tissue which separately should be ligated as this can be another source of parotid leak in the post operative period 
So uh, after uh, we have uh, ligated the parotid duct, uh, the plane between the mandible and the uh, this parotid gland is created by further uh, dividing the fascia uh, as we discussed the deep cervical fascia attachments onto the masseter and uh, this is done along with the detachment of the stylomandibular ligament which is again a facial condensation of tissue between the styloid process and the mandible. This is followed by the division of the masseter muscle and uh, as we uh, cut the masseter from its origin onto the zygoma bone there is the temporalis muscle comes into the picture. So uh, we can see here uh, this is as this is the muscle masseter muscle this temporalis muscle has been dissected and uh, the um, condyle has been exposed this we can see is the uh, pterygoid plexus of veins which is lying between the temporalis muscle and the lateral pterygoid muscle so dr ashok would you like to uh, tell the residents that uh, the uh, points of caution at this point when we are trying to expose the condyle mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a very good point, uh, Unam. So whenever we need to take the mandible, mandible from the joint, then we need to be very, we need to be uh, very much stick to the bone uh, because um, uh, just near this uh, neck of the mandible where you are putting your cursor is the maxillary artery. So you need to be very careful in dissecting that part. As far as possible, we should stick um, uh, to the bone. We, we should keep our pottery at the bone. In that way, we can be, uh, it's very safe in operating that area. And secondly, whatever you are showing the pterygoid um, venous plexus, we should be very careful after cutting the masseter because the lateral pterygoid, uh, mostly the branches of the uh, facial artery, uh, sorry, uh, maxillary artery and the uh, pterygoid uh, venous plexus, which uh, it, it's over the, uh, over the lateral pterygoid muscle. So we should be very careful uh, in that area. That's all. Correct, sir. So I think, uh, no, like, no, yes. There was one point in the chat. I think a lot of things is happening in the chat at parallel as you are elegantly speaking. I thought this point is important to clarify. I think uh, Dr. Shubra ha had asked whether it's a good idea to save the competence of the lip by taking an incision away from the commissure uh, when the commissure is free and all those things. I think that is a very important aspect. But uh, my only thing, and I'll, I'll ask, ask Pankaj also to sort of add on to it. Of course, there are a lot of other comments in the chat. It's very important initially to achieve oncological clearance first, essentially. Like you know, Theoretically, of course, you can do many things in the sense like uh, sometimes if uh, you can actually raise a visor flap, you can take it above, especially if the disease is crossing the midline. In, and if you don't take the uh, commissure, then I think you, you could be cosmetically good. But I, I feel it is very important for the larger audience to know that it is very, very important for us to visualize the tumor completely and sort of, you know, be very, very safe when you are taking the three dimensional clearance uh, for this patient. I think that's the most important aspect. So the in order, it will be oncological importance first. And then subsequently, you should have the uh, cosmetic uh, aesthetics and the functional. So it's uh, it would be in that priority. And Pankaj, you can sort of, you know, because it's a very important uh, learning point that uh, youngsters should uh, sort of understand. So I completely agree with you that uh, whether commissure has to be preserved, whether lip split has to happen at the midline or at the commissure, every decision is taken after oncological safety is confirmed. And once you have done this, all kinds of things, like if the lesion is coming up to the uh, close to the commissure, there is no point in preserving the commissure. At that point, if you try to pre uh, preserve the commissure and you have a thin rim of mucosa and you have post-op necrosis, that is worse. And what we are trying to say that this is the postgraduate teaching. This is not the experts who are listening to us. So we have to be very cautious that some things that have to be done under parental guidance is not told to the PGs. Well, just want to add a point here. I think uh, Arvind was asking whether the incision to be made exactly at the commissure or just little away from the commissure. Some surgeon practice this, they don't want to disrupt the commissure, they take just few millimeter away from the commissure. I think that hardly make any uh, 
and 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 essence in the competence of the lab because the whole idea is to keep the competence of the lab and whether it's in the commissar or a uh, few millimeter away from the commissar i think uh, the outcome is same almost correct sir priyan it has to be based basically as pankaj said it you have to tailor it based on the extent of the tumor and your uh, your achieving good clear margins three dimensionally both in the skin and the soft tissue every everything else would sort of it's important but it will be secondary to the first thing yes sir so i think yeah, um, yes sir so moving ahead with the presentation so like after this we here we can see we have exposed the condyle and we have the exposed the coronoid as well so after that the assessment of the again floor of mouth is especially important before taking a final uh, mandibular cut as many a times the you will see that the disease is creeping into the uh, lower gingival buccal circle gingival lingual circles so this is another important point which i want to uh, emphasize upon so this again is followed by the uh, uh, mandibular osteotomy with the help of uh, uh, this uh, bone reciprocating saw uh, then the floor of mouth muscles are detached depending upon the disease in the floor of the mouth if there is disease in the floor of the mouth a margin of these floor of mouth muscles can be taken however if it is free uh, they need to be detached here we can see that attachment of the anterior belly of the digastric the lingual nerve is coming into picture which needs to be sacrificed because the disease is involving the retromolar trigone area this is followed by the detachment or as, as we i said that with the margin of the mylohyoid muscle if the disease is in the floor of the mouth so once we have uh, uh, detached the floor of the mouth uh, the uh, the incision is uh, then extended into the heart palate while uh, taking the uh, cut onto the heart palate uh, the residents uh, need to be careful about the bleeding from the greater palatine artery and that needs to be cauterized well uh, uh, to uh, have a uh, clean feel in the surgery this incision then uh, is extended onto the anterior wall of the maxilla uh, and uh, it is extended on to the posterior lateral wall of the maxilla as we can see here so depending upon the uh, amount of disease or the extent of the disease in the soft tissue or the erosion of the upper alveolus the upper uh, alveolar cuts are taken so as we can see uh, in this slide that usually uh, this is the anterior uh, wall of the maxilla and the cut usually are taken uh, if they are taken below the infra orbital foramen we call them as the infrastructure maxillectomy whereas when it goes at the level or above it with the preservation of the orbital plate we call it the orbital plate uh, maxillectomy this anterior uh, incision is then extended onto the posterior lateral wall of the maxilla onto the maxillary tuberosity and then it goes in up to the level of the uh, terigo maxillary fissure you can see here this is the these are the terigoid plates that um, uh, maxillary tuberosity a uh, uh, curved osteotome is uh, engaged into this uh, cut end and then the tumor is uh, and then the maxilla is fractured downwards and medially so as to release it from the suprastructure maxilla so uh, so pankaj sir what a resident should be careful of when they are uh, doing this part especially uh, what points of caution you would like to tell them so surgically two things you should do before you take the osteotomy you should detach all the soft tissue from that area because what happens that unless you have demarcated your uh, cuts and soft tissue has been completely denuded from that area when you do the cuts if there is a bleeding then you are in full control number 1 number 2 most important thing that many people forget is the tube should have been put in the opposite nostril because many of the times when you are using the reciprocating saw and you go up to the midline once in a blue moon you will cut the endotracheal tube also or you damage the endotracheal tube or or you you know cut the cuff and then suddenly you have an emergency of deflated cuff so the tube should be on the opposite side and most important is that as you rightly said that the when you are taking the cut the palatal cut and the maxillary cut it has to be based on the imaging that you see prior to the surgery if the bone is involved the palate or the maxillary sinus is involved the height of the cut has to be appropriate because sometimes 
when you are you are doing an infrastructure maxillectomy and suddenly when the disease is creeping along the lateral wall of the maxilla of the maxillary sinus is involved then doing the revision surgery is very very difficult and third uh, many a times when the disease in the retromolar trigone rather than putting your curved osteotome in the terigo maxillary fissure and taking the osteo cut before i prefer that as you rightly said you knock down the entire infrastructure maxillectomy swing it out and then the take the entire cut along the terigo maxillary area the all the pterygoid plate based on the soft tissue extent because sometimes in the retromolar trigone area which is the classical indication for the bite uh, composite resection the disease has gone involved the pterygoid plate and sometimes a good ct scan may also miss it or sometimes when the ct scan is old you have missed it and therefore that part has to be done under complete visual inspection and then rather than using the cautery sometimes i use a strong scissor to take the entire uh, part of the pterygoid plate in the pterygoid uh, maxillary fissure area on block with the primary tool correct sir so uh, i think sir has already enumerated all the important points so going ahead with the presentation so uh, then uh, as uh, and then this is an important relationship of internal maxillary artery uh, with the posterolateral wall of the maxilla and one has to be careful regarding the pterygoid division the pterygo palatine division and like we already discussed with dr ashok the uh, mandibular division of the internal maxillary artery the various branches needs to be ligated or to be cauterized well uh, while doing this resection uh, so this uh, the tumor was then the uh, our maxilla was fractured downwards and once we have done that uh, we put uh, we can see here the medial pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid muscles uh, so these regarding the medial pterygoid muscle because most of our lesions where we are doing bite resections are uh, retromolar trigone areas where there is abutment of the disease either onto the medial pterygoid or the medial pterygoid is involved in those cases the uh, medial pterygoid needs to be resected uh, close to the pterygoid plates as we can see in the second diagram and uh, the involvement of the lateral pterygoid mainly the lower fibers uh, they can be it can be operated with an infratemporal fossa clearance however the involvement of the upper fibers which uh, come from the which originate from the base of the skull that makes the case inoperable so here we can see once we cut the medial pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid muscle we are going to encounter the pterygoid plexus of veins as we are already uh, discussed that these pterygoid plexus of veins lie between the medial and the lateral pterygoid muscle and the lateral pterygoid and the temporalis muscle so what are these pterygoid veins these pterygoid veins are basically valvulus veins which uh, uh, collect blood from or drain the area of the nose paranasal sinus nasopharynx heart palate and then they communicate with cavernous sinus they get the tributaries from ophthalmic veins facial vein and connect together to form the maxillary vein uh, which uh, be behind the uh, uh, neck of the mandible and drain into the retromandibular vein so sometimes these can lead to extensive bleeding in the perioperative and the postoperative period so uh, dr arvind uh, what uh, suggestion you would give uh, the residents to tackle with this kind of pterygoid plexus bleeding yeah uh, no i think uh, prior to that i think I, i also want to reiterate a couple of things it, it's very important that we see the imaging properly and sort of no plan i think that's the most important area where you need to do the cuts and we tend to sort of in a bite resection we tend to do those cuts initially so sometimes you you can do what is called as a compartmental clearance like you know uh, it, it all depends on the as you rightly said on the extent of the disease if it's a lower fibers so of the medial pterygoid is involved you may not need to sort of go uh, but if it's a very high involvement some parts of the lateral pterygoid involvement then the best is to avoid it you try to do a sort of a infratemporal force of formal clearance uh, detach origin to insertion of the muscles and then you possibly may want to avoid it but then again as i said like you know it it all depends on the extent of the tumor which you can sort of you know make out radiologically and if at all there is some sort of a bleeding and the best thing is to sort of not avoid avoid putting suction uh, keep on putting suction you will sort of you know traumatize the area more and more like you no know? so the best thing is sort of you know to have a controlled dissection and uh, in case you are having some problems uh, uh, you you pack the area and uh, you sort of you know at the end of it you probably take some stitches uh, later so i think it's more important to sort of you know, avoid entering the plexus uh, and by doing a sort of a compartmental resection especially if the tumors are going slightly higher up 
Yeah, just to add, uh, uh, Punam, uh, to your question to Arvind, uh, just uh, give firm pressure for some, 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 sometimes, and uh, if it not uh, controlled by that, then just to take a figure of eight kind of thing with the remaining muscles, it is yeah. sufficient many a times. Correct, correct. Even we end up taking most of the time, the we say it as a pterygoid stitch, and we take a figure of eight, which causes the butter, uh, the buttress the medial and later pterygoid muscles, so that the pterygoid plexus get. Uh, sandwich between the two. Correct, sir. So even, uh, even when there is no bleeding, also sometimes at the end of the surgery, the sense like you no, know, there would be some such small loose, like you no. Know, so I sort of you know, irrespective of the bleeding, after the entire thing is done, I tend to take a figure of eight in almost all patients. Uh, of course, if it, if there is a bleeding, then probably you may take a stitch extra or something. So that's possibly my practice, but I'm sure that you know that may be a little variant. Just uh, want to add, you know, one thing you might left say, like uh, if we, when we take a apparel villas, uh, when it uh, open the maxillary sinus, sometimes we take out the mucosa, but when it's just an apparel villa to me, when just a mucosa left, uh, what is, uh, you have not commented on that. Uh, sorry, sir, I missed that. Can you please repeat? No, like uh, when we take a upper alveolectomy or infrastructure maxillectomy, when yes, so we maxillectomy. Correct, sir. So I think we can, uh, like upper alveolectomy is usually done when the disease is basically in the lateral soft tissue in the upper gingivobuccal sulcus abutting the upper alveolus. In fact, there can be minor erosion or small erosion at the level of the uh, root of the teeth. But the moment we know that the uh, uh, disease is more in the soft tissue, which is going higher, along the posterolateral wall of the maxilla or the tumor is uh, eroding the upper alveolus basically that at least the cut is going to be just below the level of the, infra, uh, the infraorbital phenomena. So it is I think just about the level at what we are cutting and like Pankas sir, Arvind sir and you rightly said ultimately it is the proper assessment of the disease on CT scan and the clinical evaluation and taking the cut accordingly. And one so, thing to add uh, like yeah yeah Pankas yeah. Yeah, so Poonam, basically, yes. uh, for beginners, what is important to understand that you should tackle disarticulating the, uh, the head only when the tip of the uh, coronoid is released, you have detached all the fibers on along the mandible like masseter, then uh, the insertion of the medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid on the medial side of the mandible. So that means the whole mandible specimen is only hanging on the neck of the mandible now. And that is the most, uh, you know, controlled area where you can put some artery forceps along the uh, entire cuff of the tissue that you have uh, around the mandible while you are taking the cut. But the most important thing is that keep hugging the bone. When you are trying to disarticulate when you are doing segmental, then there is no problem. But when you are disarticulating, keep hugging the bone uh, with, uh, uh, you know, coagulating current at least 25 to 30 if you are using the valley lab. And uh, if you remain that, there will be oozers. Just keep taking the uh, uh, clips, the artery forceps. And once you have disarticulated, you all have uh, very rightly said that even if there is no bleeding, please put pterygoid sutures. The reason is that sometimes under the cauterization or maybe thrombosis, these vessels may close. But eventually when there is a blood pressure rise or there is, you know, the, there is a dislodge of the clot, then you can have a torrential uh, hemorrhage later. Correct, sir. Thank you, sir. So going ahead with the presentation. Uh, So uh, this, uh, this uh, the, we have removed this specimen and with uh, adequate margins, I think the mucosa is a bit folded here, so it looks a bit close, but it was good adequate margin here. Uh, the tumor, this is the kind of defect which was produced, which was complex. And in our case, we deconstructed the defect with the uh, a PMMC flap. So sir, uh, your take, uh, your opinions regarding that, what would be the appropriate reconstruction in such cases of white composite resection? So if you have done disarticulation and posterior segment mandibulectomy along with the bite composite resection, then in that situation, uh, I would say that uh, there is no skin loss, correct? This is only the bite composite resection without any skin loss. I would not 
uh, shy from doing a pectoralis major myocutaneous flap, provided the patient is lean and thin and uh, suitable for a PMMC, because I would not do it in a female. I would not do it in someone who is uh, having a bulky chest. So those will be the straight contraindication for pectoralis major myocutaneous flap. And of course, if you are doing a microvascular reconstruction, then there are two options, like uh, people who could uh, do a cantilever and do a fibula, that is also an option. But I would say that uh, in such a defect, even if you do a soft tissue reconstruction, like an enterolateral thigh flap, that would suffice. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Ashok, your viewpoint? Same, Poonam. I agree, totally agree with sir. Sir, uh, Arvind, sir? Yeah, I think it all depends on how much of the maxillary uh, uh, thing is going. Like, no? So uh, if if you are sort of, you know, having to go very high up in the maxillary, and as in some cases you are doing, then you may be sort of, you know, inclined to do a microvascular. But otherwise, I think exactly what uh, Dr. Pankaj has said, like, you know, and uh, invariably, I think uh, it all depends on the volume of the center uh, is there, no? So ideally, you can sort of you know good do microvascular, but then in case you have uh, uh, like a uh, number lot of cases, then about uh, sixty to seventy percent would be regional flap reconstruction. So that's what I would sort of uh, hazard. And there is no sort of you know hard and fast rule like you know it all also depends on the extent of the soft tissue involvement. If the lesion in the uh, in the maxilla is you know reaching closer to the midline. Or uh, for other reasons, which Pankaj had mentioned, el el elderly lady. So, in in which cases you may be slightly swayed to sort of you know doing a microvascular. Otherwise, uh, in a majority of the high volume centers, there is a significant proportion of patients who would have a regional flap in the form of a pectoralis major microtenus reconstruction. So, Poonam, one thing is very important here, as Arvind and Ashok rightly said, that if we are uh, away from the midline on the palatal side. PMMC can be sutured to the palatal edge. Yes. If we have crossed the midline or if we are reaching up to the midline, then if we take the PMMC to form the palate and suture it to the palatal mucosa, then the uh, stoma becomes uh, narrow and the oropharyngeal apertures become narrow. And that is where we can keep the mandible at uh, the PMMC lateral to the maxillary wall, on the lateral maxillary wall. So uh, you have to literally suture it to the uh, with the proline uh, with the lateral wall of the maxilla rather than bring it to the palate and for palatal fistula you have to have an obturator so this is one area where uh, you know uh, pmmc uh, whether to be brought to the palatal edge or remain on the lateral wall of the maxilla has to be taken a decision intraoperative correct sir so with this uh, we uh, uh, take, take home message so again that a proper intraoral assessment of the disease uh, clinical evaluation and digital palpation for the skin involvement, assessment of the paramandibular disease with the help of uh, clinical examination and CT scan, then uh, as, uh, maintaining the uh, uh, good lateral soft tissue margin uh, and appropriate maxillary cut like discussed uh, all the discussion and then managing the internal maxillary artery and pterygoid flexor bleeding with appropriate reconstruction is the way to go and to manage a bite composite section. With this, I conclude uh, this session. Uh, I thank uh, Pankaj sir, Arvind sir, and uh, Dr. Ashok uh, for giving their uh, inputs. And uh, I think uh, it has helped the residents and all of us in uh, understanding the bite composite sections even better. Thank you, sir. One, just one thing which uh, Dushant very rightly said that uh, whenever we uh, put uh, mandible uh, para PMMC lateral to the mandible, it drops down. So Dushant, you are right. The surgeon has to take special precaution that they hitch the tip of the mandible, uh, tip of the muscle to the surrounding muscle in the ITF and also the skin to the bony soft, uh, bony margin. And that bony margin suturing has to be done with the proline, not with the vicryl. So you are right. I take your point. Thank you, Dr. Poonam Joshi, for me.